Good morning. How are you today? Sick? Well, we have been uh, talking about the fellowship with God because our series is on uh, uh, fellowship with God. And so when Pastor uh, Boyet asked me to preach on this particular verse, I I told him, parang karugtong na nung message mo this, uh, the past week. But I understood where he's coming from. This passage kasi is very important. It's only two verses that we read. But you'll be surprised to know that it is pregnant with valuable reminders for us in light of what we have been discussing about fellowship with God. And so our... Uh, title of the message this morning is still about fellowship with God, but focuses on Christ as our advocate. And uh, we have been taught ab the, ab about fellowship with God, and that we enjoy true fellowship with God through a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that those who believe in Him have fellowship with Him even now. And through that fellowship, we experience immeasurable joy. A joy that cannot be found or that, can't, that uh, the world can uh, offer. But that's not the immeasurable joy that we're talking about. But again, we've been talking about walking in the light or walking uh, in true fellowship with God. Let me uh, just say this, no? To walk in the light means to live in the knowledge that we have been saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and have been cleansed from all our sins. And to walk in the light is to be honest with ourselves and with God. Brethren, when we are honest with God and with ourselves, we begin to see our sins in the light of God's word and will appeal to Christ for purification. And so the passage this morning is sort of an epilogue, a conclusion that closes a part of this epistle, seemingly. But yet it is a portion that holds very important reminders why John said what he said in the epistle. So but before we continue, uh, let me lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Father, I pray that the light of your word will shine upon us and that your word would come alive and speak to us individually and corporately. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This sums up our message this morning. The advocacy of Christ is our antidote of sin or to sin while walking in the light. Can you read that? It's our antidote to sin while walking in the light because we talk about true fellowship with God. We talk about the, the true uh, nature of being in fellowship with God. And I say this because the three lessons that we're going to learn this morning is connected to really enjoying our true fellowship with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is summed up in, in three uh, lessons. I say we can truly enjoy fellowship with God if we decide not to sin. And we understand that Jesus Christ is our righteous advocate and that Jesus himself is all we need to satisfy God's wrath for sin. Let me go with the first. No? We can truly enjoy fellowship with God if we decide not to sin. At first, when I was looking, looking at the, these two verses, my, uh, my first impression was to write, uh, another statement, the, the antithesis of this uh, 
statement is this. We cannot enjoy true fellowship with God if we live in sin. Now, personally, as, I, uh, as a young believer, uh, I learned that uh, when, I gained personal, uh, when I gained salvation uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, or the moment I accepted Christ in my life as Lord and Savior, I, I knew and I understood that I had this instant or this uh, relationship uh, with God. And I, underst I understood that I began to live a life of fellowship with God, walking in the light. And, uh, and in walking in fellowship with God, I understood also that that fellowship can, can be broken. And that is through sin. And so reading this passage then, I begin to understand how uh, we believers can enjoy true fellowship. We understand how we believers walk in the light because we were formerly living in the darkness. And we understand that uh, we understand true fellowship with God in light of what Christ did for us. Who Christ is and what he did for us. And so John begins his statement calling his uh, or the believers my little children. Look at this. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Now, because he is the pastor of, of this church, as the spiritual father of his flock, he calls them as a, a form of endearment, my children. And you can almost hear John saying this. No? I am writing this, these things to you. He's saying, my purpose in writing what I have just written for this epistle is not that you should abuse them no? or you're, you're living in fellowship with God as giving a license to sin but on the contrary in order that you may not sin at all. The purpose of this, this is an encouragement by the way. It is a reminder. It is, uh, it is to convey to those that he's writing to this epistle that this things that he has written is a, a reminder for them not to sin. And his motive is to encourage, not to discourage. Uh, his motive is not to encourage, but to discourage us from sinning. You enjoy true fellowship with God if you decide not to sin. Being in the light does not mean sinlessness. It does not. We don't ever suppose that because we have received salvation or salvation makes a person sinless. No. We are reminded, therefore, or we are reminded rather that sin, even as a believer, is our constant companion. That's a reality. It will be our constant companion until Christ returns and only then we will be transformed in his likeness. So being in the light does not mean having a license to sin. Again, I say this because uh, it is supposedly not to encourage but to discourage us from sinning. Now, to illustrate my point, uh, when we are children or when we uh, discipline our children, we seek to plant fear in their hearts with the hope that they will not go on sinning. Something's wrong with this. So. Okay. So when we discipline our children, we seek to plant fear in their hearts with the hope that they will not commit wrongdoing. I remember being disciplined or being warned not to do this and not to do that. Or else, 
no? You will get palo. No? And I did that also to my children because I wanted to plant fear so that they will commit, they, they will not commit that wrongdoing. But if you read again the, this passage, this was not the way it was, uh, or this was not the way John communicated this reminder or this, encur this encouragement. Think of it this way. While some assume that only the fear of punishment can keep a person from sinning, in this particular passage, the motivation is what? Obedience. Now that you know these things, my little children, no? now that you know this, and the primary motivator of obedience is love. My little children, now that you know these things, then I pray, do not sin. No? I write these things so that you may not sin. Now again, to point or to state my point clearly, this is how we should understand it. Hmm. To state the point, we are to decisively or completely, immediately, after understanding all these things, decide not to sin. That is the point of this first phrase that we're studying. We are to decisively. That means if you, if you have a uh, checklist of things to do and you uh, make your high priority and low priority activities, this is the one that you want to check off on, uh, first on your list. You have to decisively, completely, immediately, no? after understanding all these things that I have written to you, you must decisively decide not to sin. It speaks of accountability. It speaks of knowing already what you need to do in order for you not to sin. So, the action there is you decide not to sin. So in order to uh, walk in the light, as we have studied in, the, in past Sundays, the first step that you take is what? Confession of sin. 1 John 1, nine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, confession of sin involves acknowledging that you yourself have sinned. What you have done is sin. Whether small or big, it is sin, and it grieves God. And not only that, confession of sin needs uh, another action to take, that you should forsake all sin. Because confession involves repentance. And what is repentance? Repentance means you turn away from the sin. You take a 180 degree turn from that sin. And so again, going back to our point, we can only enjoy true fellowship with God if we decide not to sin. If we say we walk in the light, if we say we, if we really have been transferred from the king of, kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, then how we live our lives spells how uh, or how we uh, understand true fellowship spells how we really live as children of light. We should forsake all our sins. So again, this is to remind you, we have been reminded to live an unhampered fellowship with God, to continue to live in the light, decide not to sin. In the course of you being a Christian, therefore, 
you know what it is that hampers your life as a follower of Christ. Diba? There are certain things in our lives that we know serves as the hindrance to our fellowship with God. Because we are now understanding that while we enjoy true fellowship with God, fellowship with God can also be broken, can be hindered. And that is through sin. Let me give you an illustration. For example, you want to pray, and yet you cannot pray. The reason why you cannot pray is what? It's because you have that sin and guilt in your life. Ano sabi dun sa James? The effect of the prayer or the effective prayer of a righteous man avails much. A righteous man. At ibig sabihin po nun, righteous in the sight of God because he is clean from any known sin. And you can only do that if you regularly, regularly confess your sins. And by the way, the way it was written, if we confess our sin, that verb confess, it is supposed to be done repeatedly, again and again. So you don't confess once only. Some of us say, Lord, can I just, you know, gather all my sins and I'll pray tonight and just pray once only. No, it is done repeatedly. It is repeated action. No? But the effect is what? Immediate. So, we cannot or we can only enjoy true fellowship with God if we decide not to sin. Let me challenge you you know that there is one or two or three things in your life right now that you know serves as a hindrance to your fellowship with God. It affects your prayer life. It affects your uh, desire to read God's word regularly. It affects your testimony it affects your integrity at work. It affects how you live a life. Or shall we say, it affects your living in the light of God. If that is something that you need to do right now, that means get right with God by confessing it to God and forsaking that sin. I invite you to just you know, spend a few seconds right now. Just close your eyes and pray to God. Come on. Don't mind your katabi. That one thing that you believe is hampering you from God. Confess it right now to God. You can only enjoy true fellowship with God if you decide not to sin. My next point, no? we can only enjoy true fellowship with God if we decide not to, uh, decide not to sin. The second point, this Jesus Christ, this Jesus Christ who paid the penalty for our sins is our righteous advocate. No? If anyone sinned, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The way it was written here, it is continuous because of that word, uh, end. And if anyone says, this passage is actually an acknowledgement that uh, we are not insulated or protected from temptations to sin. It is, it is a reality each of us must face. Again, as I said, Walking in the light, walking in fellowship with God does not 
mean sinlessness. It does not mean uh, sinless perfection. It is something that we have to live with. John assumes that there is that possibility of sinful acts on, on the part of Christians and of himself that is common with them and their common need of an intervention. Kailangan pa rin ng intervention. By the way, what is sin? How do we define sin? The sin can be defined as, you know, uh, missing the mark. You aim the arrow and you hit whatever that is that you have to hit but you miss the mark. That's one way of uh, describing it. But I studied this passage, sin here, from the G Greek word hamartano, choosing sin, which means it asserts uh, the agenda of the self by or for self over God's loving plan. And so, what it means here when we choose to sin we assert or make a decision done apart and over God's plan. Let me remind you again that uh, John was speaking to believers already. Okay? And he was talking about when you sin or if anyone sins, it is that sin that chooses to make or assert someone's agenda over God's agenda. And so, every decision or action done apart from faith is sin. We assert our agenda and not God's. So again, you go back to having true fellowship with God. No? When you choose to do your agenda and get out of God's agenda that is sin this is what John was referring to and uh, you see in light of how we live our Christian lives it is it is very important to ask ourselves um, is this still you know, is this still according to God's will am I still Guided by God's plan? What are common examples of sin that people don't usually find sinful? Let me give you two. The first is we don't get angry at sin enough. The second is we neglect God's command about warning each other about sin. It is ironic that Christian sin by not getting angry enough. There is this passage in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. It says, uh, uh, in your anger, do not sin. Diba? Or when you're angry, do not sin. Be angry, another version, yet do not sin. Now, the, ten, the tense for that verb or for the verbs angry and sin, is in the present imperative. And in the New Testament, the present imperative command, it means an ongoing action. You must do it repeatedly. And the action involves long term of doing things. It should become a lifestyle. And so if I rephrase again, be angry and yet do not sin, I can put in the word repeatedly. Be repeatedly angry at the sin, not on the sinner, and yet repeatedly do not sin. Get angry with sin, not the sinner. And repeatedly not sin. Kumbaga, ibig sabihin, the reason 
why we do not enjoy true fellowship with God is we don't get angry with sin. We fellowship with sin. Inaalagaan pa natin yung sin. Pumbitin mo naman bukas uli ha. That's how we treat sin. Sabi ng isang writer, to be angry enough at the right time under God's direction is key to growth in sanctification. Kumbaga, you have to be angry at sin. It is our, the key to our sanctification. Accordingly, this is what we call righteous anger is continuously inspired by God who would not love good unless he hated evil. Kuhan niyo yun? Righteous anger is continuously inspired by God who would not love good unless he hated evil. He then goes on to say, there can be no surer and sadder token of an, un of an utterly prostrate moral condition than not being able to be angry with sin. In short, we sin by being too angry and by refusing to get angry enough at sin. Did you get that? The reason why we continue sinning because we are not angry at sin. Makes sense, di ba? We don't get angry with sin. We go to bed with sin. We continue with it. We take comfort in being with sin. And that's why fellowship with God is affected. Again, going to the first point, we can only enjoy true fellowship with God if we decide, immediately, decisively, completely decide not to sin. It is sin that really affects our fellowship with God. And so, what do we do? Get angry with sin. Get angry with the sight of a person. Don't get angry with the person. Get angry with the person's sin. And so in relation to that, another common example of sin that people don't usually find simple is we neglect God's command about warning each other about Sinning. In Romans 15, 14, we are told to warn or admonish each other about sinning and it involves using logic or critical thinking. What does that mean? We as brothers and sisters here at GCF Northeast should engage in carefronting, not confronting. Masyadong ano yung confronting eh. Sinuhaling ka. Hindi ganun. Carefronting. You allow that brother or sister to see in a loving way that he or she is sinning or committing a sin. E, ibig sabihin dito, kung alam mo na na magkakasala ka dahil dito, bakit mo itutuloy pa? The key word here is accountability. I am thankful that I have some mentors or brothers, uh, spiritual mentors that uh, I am accountable to. That they are able to confront me in a way that I realize that, yeah, tama nga. I, I need to be careful in saying things or doing things that uh, would affect my integrity as a pastor, as a teacher. We all need that. But the thing is, we neglect that. We need constant counsel 
and we all need to be admonished. We need to take the initiative out of love to give correction, rebuke, and admonition to others who need it. Likewise, we also must also be ready to receive it when it is our turn. So how do we overcome this sin? We overcome it by confronting the attitude of sin and its effect. No. Overcoming sin requires receiving, obeying of faith from the Lord. It must come from the Lord. It does not happen. No? The moment that we say, ah, kaya ko na. I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I think I'm spiritually healthy. That is the beginning of your downfall. When you say, you alone can do it. And it just happened that victory, the word victory comes from the same root word as overcomes or conquest or conquers. And you can read that sense in 1 John 5.4. And this term is also common in Revelation uh, chapter 2 and 3. Let me read some of them. Uh, some of them. Revelations 2, 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Revelations 2, 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give him a, a, a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. In verse 26 of the same chapter, he says, He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. In a sense, overcoming each decision to sin comes as we are overcome by the love of God and the supreme desire for God's approval. When we submit or when we are overcome or, or God's word overcomes our lives, when we submit our lives to him. So we overcome sin when we deliberately and consciously stop sinning. So, going back to our passage, John is saying, If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Savior. Let me look at that word, advocate, because this word is very important in understanding who Jesus Christ is and what he did for us. The advocate here comes from that word, parakletos, para, from close behind, and kaleo, make a call, which properly means legal advocate. It literally is one who makes the right judgment call because he is close enough to the situation. He knows the situation. And you know that parakletos is also use of the Holy Spirit. No? It is use of the Holy Spirit and Christ. And so therefore, both Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are our heavenly advocates who continuously work on our behalf. But let me just say this, no? The, the, the primary word parakletos here in our passage is not primarily a comfort giver, but rather as an advocate, a lawyer. So Jesus Christ is our heavenly attorney. Okay? And Christ and the Holy Spirit offer sufficient evidence. Su sufficient evidence for what? Sufficient evidence that we have been fully paid from our sins, from our debt of sins. So, this satisfies all that is needed to be divinely accepted by God, approved in God's Heavenly, heavenly court. 
So this is the implication. When we believers fall into sin, either by giving into temptation or habit or when the enemy, Satan, deceives us and, and we are overcome by sin, Jesus is our advocate who comes to our rescue. He stands as our legal representative. I like how Augustine explained Christ's work as our advocate. Ito yung sinabi niya. Our advocate does not plead that we are innocent or argue for extenuating circumstances. He acknowledges our guilt and presents his vicarious work as the ground of our acquittal. He stands in the court of heaven, a lamb as it had been slain, you can see that in Revelation 5, 6, and the marks of his sore passion are a mute but eloquent appeal. And he's like saying, I suffered all this for sinners and shall it go for naught? So, this is what Christ did for us, brothers and sisters. No? It does not plead because we are innocent. But He pleads for us because He has already done the act of sacrificing Himself. I suffered all this for sinners and shall it go for not. So, minsan magandang magbasa ng mga writings ni Augustine. Eh. It's, it really reinforces your, your faith in God. He is, not our, he is not just our advocate, He is also our righteous advocate. And here's, here's a thought here, no? When he pleads for us, he pleads on the grounds of justice or righteousness as well as mercy. Nothing good can be said of us, yet he can say so much for us. The sense, therefore, is this, in that he is righteous in contrast to our sin. The Father... The Father, by raising Jesus Christ from the dead and setting Him at His own right hand, has once and for all accepted Christ's claim for us. Therefore, the accuser, Satan, and his charges against God's children are vain. For God's righteousness in Jesus Christ is enough. He is righteous. He is not only our advocate, He is our righteous advocate. And so mga kapatid, if again, in light of our fellowship with God, we enjoy fellowship with God because of Jesus Christ who became our advocate. If we so decide not to sin, we enjoy fellowship with God. And yet, if anyone sins, we have Christ, our advocate, who stands up for us. Again, this morning, in the first service I said, when I realized this, I, I want to stop reading, I want to stop studying, and I just want to just kneel down before God and say, thank you, God, for the things that you have, for this thing that you have done for my life. It is so overwhelming. You, as a person who walk in the light, if you realize this, the, the magnitude of what God has done for us, wouldn't you respond in a way to just kneel down and worship and thank God for what He did for you, diba? I think that is the only that's the only right response 
to a realization of this passage. Lastly, Jesus himself is all we need to satisfy God's wrath for sin. If you've been following this carefully, we're looking at fellowship with God and how sin hampers our fellowship with God. And now we look at this last part of this passage because we realize that it is only Jesus himself. He is all that we need to satisfy God's wrath. He himself is the propitiation for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for those of the world. He himself, it is as, as if it underscores no one else. He himself, no angel, no religious leader can atone for sins but Jesus alone. Only he is our propitiation. Christ is the propitiation, propitiation for our sins. Ano ba yung propitiation na yan, Pastor? Okay. Look at this. From the Greek word hilasmos, not hilamos, ha? Hilasmos. No? It is an offering to appease or to satisfy an angry, offended party. In, the, uh, in, in our sense then, the offended party is who? God is the offended party. And there is a need to appease or to satisfy his righteous anger and his wrath. And it points to Jesus Christ as the offering. The offering to appease an angry, offended God. So, and Hilasmos is only used twice. And guess what? Here in our passage, 1 John 2, verse 2, and chapter 4, verse 10. Ibig sabihin, dito pinag-usapan itong particular na passage na ito, o binigyang diin. By the sacrifice of Himself, Jesus Christ provided the ultimate uh, hilasmos or propitiation. Jesus satisfied all divine wrath on sin for all who received Him. Okay? The idea here is that all this anger or wrath, no? someone, God has been offended. No? And that a sacrifice needs to be done. In, in a sense, if you recall in the Old Testament, a priest yearly would come into the temple no, carrying a lamb that was slain and he would sprinkle the blood on the uh, mercy seat. The mercy seat in, in the Greek is hilasterion. And in a sense, when it is sprinkled, the the significance there is the blood cleanses the sin. But the, the, the difference is they have to do this again and again yearly. But with Christ as the ultimate sacrifice, once and for all, he became the propitiation, the hilasmos, so that we can enjoy once and for all forgiveness for our sins. Propitiation underscores the wrath of God upon us, redemption for our for our, our captivity to sin, justification for our guilt, and reconciliation for our enmity against God and alienation from Him. Sabi ni J. Stott, John Stott, this metaphor do not flatter us. They, however, expose the magnitude of our need. We are not able to enjoy true fellowship with God if we did, do not realize that this is what Christ did for us. Mga kapatid, do not take lightly being in fellowship with God because it was bought with a price. It was bought with a price. 
So this is what propitiation means for you and me. It cancels God's anger or wrath on us because of our sins. It was taken away. God as our advocate, uh, Jesus Christ as our advocate, when God sees us, he sees Jesus Christ and the wrath of God is taken away. He does not become angry at us because of what Christ did. We are forgiven of our sins. And we are reconciled to God. It solves the problem of unforgiven sins. And by the way, if you if you realize this, that you know that Jesus Christ had to go through all this for the forgiveness of our sins, it no it, it makes you makes you now go back to that uh, idea. Some some of us no have not forgiven a, a particular per person in our life. I have some of those in my life. When I look at that person, at talagang hindi naman talaga dapat patawarin eh kung tutuusin. No? Every time mabanggit yung pangalan, nakakagalit eh. And I see an object that is supposedly connected with that person, nawawalan na ako ng gana eh. But when I go back and now learn because God has forgiven me from all my sins, should I not also extend forgiveness to that person? I am not worthy not to extend forgiveness because God has extended forgiveness on my sins. I Bigata, no? Not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. To summarize, no? Masyadong, sabi ko sa inyo, itong verses 1 and 2 na to, eh. It can extend to a series, eh. Actually. Verse 1 and 2. Series po ito, eh. Kaya nahirap na hirap akong i-compress, eh. To summarize Christ's propitiation for the sins of the whole world, it means... It is adaptable to all people or races, all ethnic backgrounds. All the whole world nga eh. The whole world. It does not pertain to cosmos, but it, it pertains to the world, uh, to the world, to the to the community, to the to the people. Every ethnic all races, ethnic background to all. It is sufficient in merit. What it means is Christ's propitiation or Christ's death or Christ's offering of his life is sufficient in merit for all. And therefore, there is no need for additional suffering in order to save them. Once and for all nga eh, tapos ni eh. No more sacrifices should be done. And because it is sufficient in merit, it is efficient to those who repent from their sin and believe in Jesus Christ and accept Him by grace through faith. Hmm, limited atonement. Paka na natin pag-usapan yung tulip at uh, limited atonement na yan. Doon na lang sa klase nyo sa discipleship track. But in a sense, this is what we're saying here. Christ died for all. And his death was sufficient for all. But in a sense, it is efficient to those who accept it, who repent from their sin, and believe in Jesus Christ. All right? So again, I go back to this idea. The advocacy of Christ is our antidote to sin while walking in the light. We can only enjoy true fellowship with God if we decisively, completely, immediately 
decide not to sin. And if anyone sins, Jesus Christ, our advocate, no? he extends advocating for us through his sacrifice of his own life. I believe if you now understand the magnitude of what Christ did for us, you will commit to a life of unhampered fellowship with God by committing to a life solely and dedicatedly lived for God. And that means doing away with your sin. Decisively not to sin. Let's pray. Lord, I, I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord, that you will lead them as they have in through the part of this sermon, Lord, they have prayed and committed and confessed to you that particular sin that hampers them from walking in the light. And I pray, Lord, give them victory. Lord, get them angry at sin. Make it con consistent, Lord. And that, Lord, make each of us accountable to each other if we receive a, a, a rebuke, a correction, an admonition from a brother or a sister, let us receive it with humility and that we will not be afraid as well to, to say rebuke, admonition, and correction. For in that way, Lord, we will be accountable to and for each other. All for your glory and for your honor. Amen. Amen. Music